Hi all, welcome to the third lecture in our IAP series on radio. Um, tonight, Dr. Frank Lynn is going to be talking about software-defined radios. Um, Dr. Frank Lynn has a bachelor's in physics and computer science from University of Washington and a PhD in geophysics, also from University of Washington, and now works as a research engineer at MIT's Haystack Observatory. He also is an IEEE member, a member of the American Geophysical Union, and the former U.S. National Committee Chair for the International Union for Radio Science. Propa Commission on Radio Ionosphere and Radio Propagation. So. But Not the whole thing. That, I'd like to welcome Frank Lynn. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for the invitation to speak here today. I appreciate it. Um, you know, radio is what I do, and I've been doing this for uh, a little too long now. <laughs> but um, in any case, uh, today I was asked to talk about software radio. And software radio has really been um, a, a thing here uh, that we've been using in MIT Haystack. And it, it's been transforming beneath our feet, I would say. It's, it's, it's literally a revolution that's been going on since the late 50s and early 60s. And it's progressing to the point where I, I would call it the democratization of radio is upon us and we don't know what to do. Um, and so I'll talk today about software radio. I'll give you some background on it. I'll talk about some of our work that we've done related to it. I'll show you software radio systems. I have a little bit of a demo of some inexpensive soft, of an inexpensive software radio you could <coughs> probably go afford to purchase. Uh, some of you who have budgets can purchase the more expensive software radios potentially. But uh, and uh, you know I'll, I'll sum up kind of with some of the things that are interesting me in the application of si software radio scientifically. Um, so I work at MIT Haystack Observatory, which for those, you know, you've, you've, you're seeing a number of people from Haystack in this series, so you've probably been introduced to it already. We're about 43 kilometers as the radio wave goes from where we are standing now, um, plus or minus, you know, a few kilometers. And um, I need why, the light for you. Oh, you need the light for me. All right. Um, the, uh, so the, you know, we do radio science. We do radio astronomy, space surveillance, satellite imaging. Uh, we do geospace science, the study of the space environment, and uh, underneath it all are also developing fundamental techniques. And the complex has a number of radars and radio telescopes, and since this is not a tour of Haystack, I'm not going to go through them all. Uh, I have spent a lot of my career um, nursing along the UHF radar system and using it to do science, uh, as well as more recently I've been working with pretty much all the systems at Haystack at one level or another. Uh, there's a combination of MIT campus academic research and uh, MIT Lincoln Laboratory defense research facilities at Haystack, and we work jointly together. Uh, it's, it's actually relatively seamless in general, uh, and uh, it does make for interesting meetings, though. Um, so. Um, Underneath software radio is a desire to be able to <coughs> manipulate and use the electromagnetic spectrum. And radio, you know, is a slice of the spectrum. We normally operate for human beings in the regime of visible light, which is this little sliver of the electromagnetic spectrum. And radio waves actually occupy a significant chunk at wavelengths that are, you know, fairly significant. They, they're interesting because they're actually comparable to human beings in, in wavelength. Um, and, and there has been a progression as time has gone on from being able to manipulate you know, light and radio waves at very lar long wavelengths and progressively going to shorter wavelengths. And this combined with you know, digital technology has given rise to the ability to really utilize the electromagnetic spectrum as a function of frequency and to chop it up into, you know, into bands, as we call them, and to use those bands for various applications. And you know, if we started from scratch today, I don't think we would do this. I think we might treat things very differently, and there's been kind of efforts to try to get people to think about that and you know, to make radio systems that are agile and jump around. And software radio is behind the ability to do a lot of that, but um, it really behooves us to think in the future about different methodologies of using the radio spectrum. Now the radio spectrum is you know, also interesting from the point of view of the Earth and looking out in the space environment in that when you look through the Earth's atmosphere as a function of wavelength here and, and you know, how opaque the atmosphere is, we have a visible light window, there are some infrared windows, there are micro
microwave windows, and then there's a radio window. And then down at the lower frequency end, the Earth's ionosphere eventually cuts you off because of the plasma frequency in the ionosphere. And so the, the radio waves from space don't really get to the Earth very effectively, and radio waves from the Earth at low enough frequencies don't get into space very effectively. Um, but uh, you know, manipulating the spectrum, um, it used to be very complex and hard and, and now it is becoming easier and easier and easier in many ways. Uh, on the other hand, we're trading complexity in devices and hardware often for complexity in software. And so it isn't as simple a trade-off as analog radio old. If you're doing analog radio, you belong in the 20th century or something like that, right? I can say that now because it's the 21st century. But, um, it, you know, and, and if you're doing digital radio, software radio, you're doing, you're doing the modern thing. Is that there's, there's actually a merger of both, a role for both. And I think that um, the combination, it remains to be explored how to make uh, software radios, say, very power efficient, for example. Um, and uh, so I'll, I'll talk about that. Um, early analog radios, okay, so you know, when we think about analog, we think about physical devices. We phys you know, somebody figures out, oh, I can make a diode, <laughs> and I can do really interesting things with a diode. And you know, it literally started with you know, experimentations with crystals and, and, and the un underlying physics. And you know, if if you were a precocious lad in the late 19th century, and you were you were you know somewhat wealthy and able to spend your time how you wanted to, maybe you spent your time playing around with these interesting ideas about about uh, you know electricity, you know. <laughs> and and uh, there was a person, of course, Marconi, who did that. And in 1895, at the age of 20, he demonstrated the Marconi monopole, which is is the birth, as we would think of it, is of radio of modern radio. I would say, and and that's actually. Actually, you know, you know, how much have we done by the time we're 20? Our society kind of biases us to study, 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 do different things, go to school, and there's maybe less room for people to be uh, be innovative there. But um, you know, then then we went on to having things like the crystal crystal diode radios very very shortly there, thereafter. Regenerative receivers, which was Edwin Armstrong was behind that, and this is really the path that led to, to FM radio as we as we see it today. That's the Armstrong superheterodyne. And you know, listeners get an earful by radio. So radio was the early subversive. <laughs> way of, of breaking the communication of newspapers and, and tabloids and it was the new thing at one point and today I think it's you know now with the digital revolution radio is becoming the ubiquitous connector of everything we do uh, in terms of the transmission and manipulation of information um, and you know just to give you scope well, you know, you could in 1936, you could buy a radio receiver that would tune from half a megahertz to 30 megahertz for the the bargain price of $105. All right? And today, if you do the inflation calculator from the government and you believe the numbers, it comes out to about $2,000, okay? So 1918. Um, you know, this is an RTL software radio dongle. It goes from 30 megahertz. It doesn't quite actually it'll do it'll do a little lower in one mode, but up to several gigahertz and it's $15. So we've seen a change in absolute terms in the complexity and cost of these systems. And that change is is in many ways just getting rolling. Uh, you know, it's been an ongoing process. There have been a number of steps in the complexity and the cost of the radios and in their performance they offer. Um, and it's been coupled one to one recently with the development of computing. And uh, you know, people always say, you know, I have a colleague who always says it's fifteen dollars, Frank, and I go, yeah, plus the thousand dollar computer you're hooking it to. So it's it's really a thousand and fifteen dollars, or a few hundred and fifteen dollars, if maybe you're using a Raspberry Pi. Or maybe you can get it down under a hundred. Uh, but we are headed for the era where you have the one dollar software radio, uh, I think. So. Uh, Analog radio receivers are really, um, their evolution, as I said, went from low frequencies to now all the way up into terahertz. And they go from spark gaps to tubes to transistors to integrated circuits and now nano devices, you know, quantum lasers of various kinds, integrated masers that you might etch out in the lab to get you into terahertz. And there's all kinds of interesting things that have been opened up by this progression, which took us from, you know, VLF, very long wavelengths into HF, which that brought about transatlantic propagation and communication and a revolution in things, um, you know, like you, know, you could have a ship and if it was in trouble, it could send out a distress signal with Morse code. Uh, and then, you know, gradually we moved up, there was kind of a, at World War II, a shift up 
above HF and into UHF and L band, and then very quickly to X band. And uh, more recently, we've seen a shift to higher frequencies like W band, which we have a radar at Haystack that operates there. Um, and you saw receivers fundamentally transform. And a lot of the transformation was about achieving frequency selectivity. So you have a ability to transmit some level of information through some sort of modulation in a band of frequency. And you usually band limit that, uh, both because that's how we decided to manipulate the spectrum and allocate it. So government allocates it in chunks, and it does it in terms of frequency, and, and in terms of spatial location and application. And so we, we have decided to separate things out in frequency. And a lot of the early technology was about doing that frequency selectivity. And so early systems like you know, a direct detection receiver, we have a, you know, a diode detector of some time, a bandpass filter, and the energy for the detection came from the radio wave. Well, you can still build these. They're crystal radios. You can go get a nice kit or figure out how to do it yourself. And you know, if you put this together with some headphones, you can, in fact, hear AM broadcasts because AM broadcasts are still going on from when they started early on, and they're very powerful, and, and they have enough energy that you can actually hear it when you do this. Um, you know, quickly people decided that they wanted to filter and amplify and provide some, some level of, of um, improvement in the signal to noise ratio that was being experienced by the audio listener. And you know, early on this was all audio. It was all listening and people listening on headsets. And uh, these days, you know, we listen with computers and, and often we have the machines doing the listening these days. Uh, instead of the human beings doing the listening. But you know, we have regenerative receivers was part of the progression. And then the superheterodyne was really where Armstrong came in and you had a, an absolute transformation in our ability because we substituted in this local oscillator and a mixer. And that allowed us to very easily vary this local oscillator and translate a selection of RF signals in through a filter that then could be fixed. And so you weren't having to make custom filters for each frequency you were wanting to manipulate or listen to. You were able to use that local oscillator in order to select a band of frequency. And then, you know, you put it through your, your audio detection and your amplification, and you, you have, lo and behold, you had radio. And of course, you can make these more complex. You can have multi-stage superheterodynes. You can have up-down converters. You can do all kinds of clever things. And um, you know, this, this is a wonderful way to do radio, actually. I, I have to say, I've, I've built many of these uh, types of receivers over the years, and we use them often to limit the complexity of the digital receivers, uh, of the software radios, uh, to limit the bandwidth, to improve the selectivity of a digital system uh, by adding an analog system in front of it that has performance characteristics that are better for the particular task. Um, now, these do have a disadvantage. They tend to be physical devices. They tend to be larger. Uh, of course, everything's miniaturized, and we have lots of wonderful circuitry now. You can just go on the web and find any mixer you want that has wonderful performance and low noise amplifiers that are incredible. And you know, it's, it's this golden age of components and parts and the ability to put together almost anything you want. Um, and, but they do take space. They often use power, so, so you will end up with energy dissipation in these circuits. Um, that's often actually a lot less energy dissipation than you will have in a dig equivalent digital process that does the, the signal processing equivalent of these stages. Uh, they also, importantly, I think, exhibit variability. So your filters can drift. If you have a very narrow band filter and its response drifts as a function of temperature and you're in a place where the radio has to operate over a range of, range of temperatures, it can be very difficult difficult to uh, uh, you know tune that out unless you have you know a human being sitting there tuning a dial uh, sometimes you have systems that need to be calibrated for example and you have to calibrate those kinds of effects out um, also you know if you want to change your filter bandwidth well you need either a filter that can be changed in bandwidth or you would need to switch between different filters and that frequency selectivity well all of a sudden I'm multiplying out the physical size of my system and the complexity and the number of things that need to be calibrated. Um, so this, this variability was important. Another thing that is important is this detection circuitry. Is, you know, initially you're working with various kinds of, of modulation. So you're attempting to encode information on the radio transmissions and then you're attempting to receive it at the receiver and, and demodulate it. And those demodulation circuits exhibit all the same kinds of effects. And if you want to change the kind of modulation you're doing, well, you know, you have to be able to switch in a different stage. So, you know, very often you could switch an amplitude modulation stage in for a uh, frequency, you know, modulation stage, narrowband frequency FM, for example. Um, it, that has its limits. And 
Our mathematical ideas about how to encode information have progressed tremendously. And it allows us to, to encode information in very complex, clever ways, adaptive ways even. And um, that is very difficult to handle in the analog radios. So this gave rise to um, oops. This gave rise to the idea of software radio, and it really <coughs> started to show up as a software radio concept <coughs> in about 1984 was when it, and it was when it really started to show up as software radio. Digital receivers, the idea of attaching digitizers and computers to radio systems predates this. Um, in the software radio world, the communications world, most people think of this showing up in 1970 from TRW. Um, I will argue in a little bit that <coughs> actually the radio astronomers were doing all the fundamental structures of the modern software radio about a, you know, a few years earlier. Not a lot earlier, but a few years earlier. It's very contemporaneous with this. <coughs> you have the idea though what if I took a lot of that analog electronics and implemented it digitally? And you know, this, this at some level you know, can happen on transmission or on reception. Um, on reception here you have something where you have you know, an antenna. So you have to have that physical transducer into the electromagnetic environment that allows you to efficiently couple the electromagnetic waves. Uh, and it also provides, antennas are a whole topic in themselves, so that's another complete talk. But, um, and, and, and you can just go on and on and on if you really love antennas. But um, you know, then you have some sort of RF analog stages. Uh, these can be filters, these can be translation, they can be amplification, they can be switches, they can be all kinds of, well, that entire analog radio can live in front of the digital radio. And for a while it looked like, you know, early in software radio, everyone was very focused on the idea of um, what I would define as the pure software radio. Okay, so I, 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 I was really complimented in one of the things I'll show you. It's one of the papers I was involved in with software radar. We had a, someone who came back in a follow on, you know, follow up paper, and they, they described ours as, you know, well, this may be the first pure implementation of a software radio concept and I, for radar. And I was really thrilled by that. Um, but on the other hand, what's happened actually is it's too expensive to do that still for everything. And, and so we have seen what I would call the rebirth of analog radios as part of the digital radios. Um, so you had military and government systems and you know there were many systems with data acquisition and signal processing. The whole birth of signal processing as a real-time application to digital signals where bandwidths have just increased and increased has gone with this. And this, dev this digital revolution is underlying this, is you know, the ability to make these wonderful computers and integrated circuits and chips that allow us to do this. Now, Early on, the idea was, can we replace some of these analog stages, and in particular, the demodulation? Can we actually go in and change the mode of the radio? So say you know, you've got a military radio, and you've got to talk to three different types of, of platforms, and you can have one platform that you just tell it what to do, and it, and it does it. Um, this, this idea really was reinvented by Joseph Matola, and Joseph's down at, he's, Joe's down at uh, Virginia Tech right now, and actually, I had the pleasure of hosting him for a visit to Haystack at one point, and we, we got to talking a lot about these systems. But um, that was a rebirth of this idea. There was a lot of this going on in the DoD and the classified world, and in the, actually the scientific world had a tremendous amount of digital analog hybrid combination systems where there was real-time signal processing going on. And, and Joe came along and, and kind of redefined all this and said, look, this is, this is software radio and we can do this. And you know, he was, I, I'd have to, I can't even see my eye chart down here. This is Moore's Law. This is, you know, this is early computers. This is where we are now. And this is the future of, you know, quantum computing and DNA computing. And, um, you know, anything you want to do for computing, all right, you do the software radio with computing. And, you know, this is actually an important thing is software, you can have software defined capabilities and modes. You can have software realized instrumentation. You can have software radio radios that realize the signal processing for the entire radio on a chip. You can have multiple software radios that you bring together for joint processing and you realize instrumentation from the composite of those radio systems. So the, the, the ensemble of radios becomes the instrument. Um, now many, you know, this, this, uh, this, you know, the real term software defined radio showed up in 1995 from Stephen Bluss. And this was about the time I started doing stuff with what looked like software radio, uh, software radars 
of various types. Uh, but analog radios you know, can be more or less complex. And in particular, the software complexity is actually vastly exceeding in many ways the hardware complexity at a very fundamental level. And we're, you know, the, we're able to build systems that have multiple modes. I mean, you know, if you're doing scientific research, often you want one mode and you never want to touch it and you want to calibrate it. And then you can understand it because there's one mode. If the system is dynamically switching between 600 different modes to optimize for something, it may be un un incomprehensible to a human being what's coming out, even though it might be optimal by some criteria. Uh, the other thing is that this computing, you know, we have had a pro progression from ASICs to FPGAs to DSPs to GPUs to CPUs or some hybrid combinations. These are merging now. Um, you know, the FPGA DSP merger has kind of occurred. Um, and there's going to be more computing as people come up with clever ways to do incredibly high performance computing of various types. Um, you, can, you can make software radios that use whatever kind of computer you want. And, and that's something people often forget. People often think, oh, FPGAs are where software radio is today. Uh, yeah, for the moment. And, and you know, it's not actually the important part of the software radio. It's the, the mathematics and the computing. And the idea that we can do that is, is far more important than the particular radios. Uh, one of the other things that has happened is software radios, I think, have an Achilles heel that is power consumption can be high. And that is a challenge for everyone to overcome. And it, there's been great progress. We've gone from kilowatts to 100 watts. You know, that's a factor of 10. That's pretty good. But, you know, it'd be nice to be down at a watt for a lot of systems, and that's challenging. Um, Another thing that's very, very important for scientific applications, some kinds of applications, is you can keep the bits around of a software radio. So once you've coupled into the digital world and the information domain, instead of, you know, in contrast to an analog system where the coupling is via an audio output to a human being, or maybe even to some signal processing that reduces data in real time, we can take that radio signal received, digitize it, bring it into a computer, and we can manipulate it and keep it around. We can keep it around for a short time. Uh, we're starting to be able to build systems that for narrow bandwidths keep data for the life of the instrument. And that's very important, for example, for radio astronomy systems, for instruments that could observe the space environment. We begin to have a tremendous amount of information stored at the software radios. And we actually often have more limited bandwidth into them. And it becomes a problem of how do you find what you want that's interesting in this data buffer that has been accumulated. Um, early software radios, well, I'm, I'm biased. I'll, I'll show you. This is, this is widely considered the first true software radio. This is Speakeasy uh, from 1991. It was, an, uh, I think, believe an Air Force project. And the idea was how do you make those military radios communicate to each other, have different demodulations. Um, this is the Midas-1 software radar, which was an actual software radar implemented up at MIT Haystack Observatory in 1994. Uh, and it did real-time processing for those it, it, people who know the transputer architecture. Well, uh, you know, if, you've got it, if you're old enough, you can go look it up if you're not. And uh, it was all implemented in custom wire wrap cards. It's very, it was actually kind of a scary system. I inherited this when I got to Haystack. And it, it fortunately promptly died right, right after we, from a lightning strike, right after we got software radar are working and so there was no question that we were transition because the engineer was six years gone who had developed this monstrosity and it was his first radar he had ever built so it was it was you know I love his notes you know he's learning in his he's a great note taker his notes have you know keep a keep a journal sometimes or an electronic log of what you do because his notes were wonderful and very scary to me as an engineer who kind of knew what he was doing and going oh god I got to get rid of this and replace all this um, the, uh, this, this custom hardware era, uh, I, this is the VLB Mark I system, 1967. It has, uh, you know, there's an atomic clock that's not there. That's a coherent oscillator that's actually incredibly important to using software radios together. So if you want to use more than one radio together, the ease with which you can do it is actually dominated by the clock stability for many applications. And so here you had a hydrogen maser one of the most stable clocks we can create. We're, we're starting to make things like optical lattice clocks that are better. Um, you have a computer and a data acquisition system. There's obviously some test equipment to monitor what's going on and a data recording device, tape. And you know you shouldn't underestimate the power of these tapes if you load a 747 full of the tapes and fly it somewhere. Is you can transport an incredible amount of data and up 
up until maybe about a decade ago, this is how radio astronomy moved wideband data around the world. Now they do it with hard drives. Soon it will be SSDs. It's actually uh, vastly simpler to move the information as media than it is to get network bandwidths that are reliable across the distances involved, which are the whole planet in general these days. But this, this system is, is, from my point of view, I realized at a certain point that all the radios I was implementing were in fact very similar to the early VLBI systems for interferometry that the astronomy community had invented. Um, another thing that came along then after the custom hardware era, uh, which these were you know, defense and scientific systems, they were expensive, was what I call the ASIP, the ap Application Specific Integrated Circuit Chip Era. This is where you have proprietary chips that were developed. Uh, there were several of them. Analog Devices had one, Harris had one. This is great, a company called Gray Chip, which was eventually bought by Texas Instruments. And this brought about a absolute revolution. Just like we're having a software radio re revolution today, this was the first software radio rev revolution. We went from $100,000 to $1 million class systems to $10,000 class systems and actually the power levels got into the two to six watts per chip range. So you, you know, you often had a computer associated with it, which was 500 watts or 300 watts, but you, you were in a range that all of a sudden was, you know, a half a kilowatt could do for your software radio and you could do a lot with it. Uh, one of my colleagues, Alan Rogers, who you'll hear from later um, in this series on radio astronomy, um, he actually used these gray chips to build what we call the deuterium array. This was to look for deuterium in the galaxy um, and they used digital beam forming. It had 1,152 uh, great chip channels of RF that it combined digitally uh, to do this uh, astronomical measurement. And you know, this, this actually for a long time, it, I, I think it may have finally been surpassed. It was the leader for an array system in cost per channel. Some of that, Alan's incredibly clever at getting rid of stuff. Um, you know, like the clocks are bust on the, on the power strips that are, this thing's mounted on. I mean, there's all kinds of really wonderful things about this, but you have a couple computers, you have boards with gray chips, you have some analog electronics, and then in the field there were a whole bunch of antennas. Um, so this was a very early array uh, radio telescope system, and it's, it's a precursor to the effect of software radio and so on astronomy, which I'll, I'll touch brief, only briefly on later. Uh, this is what I was working on in 2000, 2001. It was the Midas W software radar systems, Millstone data acquisition system. Uh, this is actual data. We have since 2001 kept the data associated with our UHF radar system. Um, you know, over narrow bandwidths, a few hundred kilohertz of bandwidth. And, uh, you know, there's computing associated with it, there's racks of electronics and digitizers, but this was a network streamed software radar system where actually almost even the digital down conversion beyond an initial down convert was done in software and in general purpose software uh, written in, you know, largely C and then later Python and C. Um, Modern software radios is where we have come to now. And modern software radios have become actually incredibly low cost. Um, the, the RTL software radar, radio dongles, uh, you know, the, people made a digital television, a European digital television demodulation chip in China. And they put a test mode into it that put out IQ data. It put out voltages with the phase information preserved with the voltages. And, and these things started showing up for 15 or $20. And you know, we've done actually a lot of science with these uh, for, for student projects, for demonstrations, uh, for building systems that are inexpensive per channel. Um, and it's actually kind of incredible if you spend some time trying to calibrate the things and use them, how well you can do. And uh, you know, you do, as I mentioned, have to have a computer plugged into it. And, and the computers for a long time, you know, the you know, best you get is a $1,000 laptop or a $700 laptop. You can get that down now into the few hundred dollar computer if you're willing to live with the performance. Um, Largely, these systems that have come about, you know, it's high performance computing, amazing ADCs and, DAs and DACs. Uh, and, and then there's been an effort, an, in, an industry effort, to create very highly capable integrated radios. And often these are very well thought out in terms of a balance between the analog electronics and the digital electronics and how you get the best overall frequency selectivity, how you get the best dynamic range. Uh, now, these are largely all FPGA based radios. I mean, we've got Edis here. Edis, ha Edis showed up right around to GNU Radio. They were, they were one of the early uh, people developing GNU Radio. And this time frame, the N200 showed up. And 
actually, I didn't pay much attention to it for quite a few years. I, I was off doing other radios at the time that were from the prior era of the, of the ASIC era. But um, these systems came about and began to establish the open source aspect of software radio, which has also been key to its propagation into the world and to the, to the commoditization and, and the democratization of software radio. Um, you know, these have progressed to very high performance systems. I'm using N310s in some of our systems. And you know, you can handle, yeah, can actually handle about 30 megahertz of bandwidth with an N200. These are up into the 300 megahertz range. We're, we're getting giga sample per second radios. This is actually a card I built a digital receiver with that's got, uh, that's quad, digi quad giga sample per second class digitization and streaming. Um, now, the thing that happened is the power went up. <laughs> we're, we're ending up at 8, 10 to 80 watts per software radio unit. Per channel, it's still fairly close to the gray chips. But, uh, and then you add a computer. Now, the computers I'm using are usually between 50 and, 15 and 40 watts. 40 watts gets you a very high performance system. 15, you have to live with bandwidth limitations. But this is you know combined power levels of 25 to 100. And, 120 watts. It's still limiting. I, I've got a project I'll talk about that's battery, solar and battery powered. It's a distributed system, and it's actually very hard to deal with these power levels in the in the instrumentation. Still, you have the return of the tuner in the modern software radio. So this is to allow you to use less expensive digital electronics, and in particular, if you take the giga sample per second radios and you try to do all your software radio with them, you can burn a lot more power because the switching rates in the electronics are much much higher. Um, radios costs. I mean, we're going from ten dollars to ten thousand. You know, ten thousand dollar end, ten dollar end for the RTL dongles. There are corresponding differences in performance often when the radios. Uh, they, they have really different characteristics in how they accept clocks in dynamic range, uh, in their production of spurious signals, which I'll talk a little bit about. Uh, Underneath this, these radios change almost daily. We're about to have a lot of Xilinx RF system on a chips showing up. Uh, they're going to they're gonna knock the per channel costs down eventually. Uh, the radio isn't the important part. This is going to change. We're going to figure out how to get rid of these, integrate them with things, some applications. You know, maybe we'll grow them in trees at some point. Um, but you know, nevertheless, the software, the information structures behind this are actually what's important. And understanding what those patterns and architectural implications are of specific designs is actually more important often for producing a system that's optimal for a given purpose. So how do we represent RF signals? Well, we use analog to digital conversion. You can flip this and do digital to analog conversion if you want to want to transmit. Uh, and you know, so we've got some voltage that, as a function of time, is varying in amplitude. And we want to digitize it. And we're going to quantitize it into specific levels. And if we have a perfect A to D converter, it, it maps to the level of quantization of the real radio signal. And we try to oversample. We try to have enough bits of dynamic, you know, have enough spur-free dynamic range and effective number of bits in our converters. And we want to get these things so that they're they're linear over a large range and so that they're not producing false signals, except where we know they're doing it at some level, because they all actually lie to us at some levels, because digitization isn't perfect. I mean, sometimes there are errors. Uh, sometimes the, the signal is fluctuating in a way where we're not sampling all the energy. So if you if you have something that's, you know, if this is frequency and this is the Nyquist zone of your A to D converter that you're digitizing here, and you have a lot of energy going on at higher frequencies, well, guess what? There's aliasing, you know. Uh, it all comes down and folds down, and this is what you see in your software radio. Isn't it fun? You can try to figure out whether you're seeing what you want there. Um, now, you know, you can do better. You can make very, you can filter all this and make it very clean. You can actually pick the, put the energy in a given Nyquist zone. Modern ADD converters, you know, can actually, you know, you know, uh, you know what, what is called subsampling signals. They can pick up signals that are varying at higher frequencies. And as long as the bandwidth of the signal is narrow enough, you're still oversampling it in a Nyquist sense. And this will fold down in the aliasing. And lo and behold, you can get a nice spectrum out of what you wanted to measure. Um, and, you know, these, the other thing that's going on here is, Anything you do to this signal, once you've digitized it digitally, can introduce effects like this. So you have to often do frequency selectivity in digital signal processing. Well, OK, there's a numeric oscillator associated with that. That numeric oscillator has some 
you know, quantization. It's got some dynamic range. It's got spurious components, all of which are going to get combined with the input information from the radio signal that you digitized to confuse you, cause you trouble, and, and generally make things less linear and less ideal than we'd really like. Um, oscillators and clocks, it turns out, are critical to this process. The analog to digital converters and digital analog converters are, are doing these digitizations on periodic boundaries. And that periodicity is very critical to the performance of the radios often. In fact, a lot of the systems that we build are often clock limited in their actual performance for their application. As you, you start to look, for example, at radio astronomy systems where you want to look and compare signals from different locations together in order to make a phase measurement to do interferometry. And when you do that, what you can find out is, well, if, as you go at higher and higher frequency, you need better and better clock stability and better and better, uh, you know, in terms of the uh, phase noise of the clocks, for example, in order to actually make the measurement and, and get the information out that you really wanted to. Um, you know, Nyquist sampling I mentioned is the common approach. It's not the only approach. Fourier analysis in general is one approach for fitting information at the, you know, th that's a signal of some type. You can use other basis sets. You can use other approaches. You can do model-based fitting in the A to D converters, for example. There was a, you know, there's a whole area of compressive sensing, for example, that came out of this idea. Well, I got this giga sample converter and it's eating a lot of en energy, but I'm measuring something that has a kilohertz of process bandwidth for the information. That seems really inefficient. I'm taking billions and going down to kilohertz. Can I do away with that? And that's still a question in software radios, I think, is how can we do many of the things we want to do without the giga samples necessarily? Um, alias sampling, subsampling, subsampling is used in many systems. Uh, I built systems that subsample, for example. Um, and this ADC performance under this, we've got marvelous converters today. They're, they're just beautiful devices, even in the last decade, uh, or actually the last few years, they're, they're taking incredible strides. Um, now, once you've digitized this information, you, you're going to do some software radio on it. You want to do that frequency selectivity I mentioned. And so we're going to do digital down conversion. So one of the things we're doing, and I was told you actually, if you've seen the last series in the series, you were told all about IQ uh, modulation and detection. And so you know something about it, hopefully. But the basic idea is that in the world around us, when we have a radio signal, when we digitize that voltage, it isn't enough to just know amplitude. We often want to know phase relative to some arbitrary point we define, and we want to know how that phase of those radio signals varies. And one of the reasons is we can use phase to encode information. We can use it usefully. We can use it to encode information in a radar system or in a communication system. Uh, we can use it along with amplitude and do quadrature amplitude modulation, for example. So we want to bring down and treat the voltages from a system as complex numbers. And very often voltages actually, when you get down to it, don't actually have real information. What you want are power-like quantities. You want products of voltages. Whether it's for astronomy or whether you're looking at the power, the signal to noise ratio, for example, and you want to estimate the power in a system, you're often not actually wanting to take you know, comp you know, complex products of, of the voltages. Um, when we do this digitally, or in an, you can do this in an analog radio if you want, we're going to have some local oscillator. This is the this is the superheterodyne type of principle again, and then we're going to take and we're going to mix the signals and and do some filtering on them. In this case, we'll do some digital filtering, and we've got this mixing process where we have an in phase component and a quadrature component, and the relationship between those two is 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 the complex phasor of the of the voltage, and it tells us the phase relationship of that signal <coughs> relative to this clock. We feed it. This is where another clock comes in. It comes in as the numeric oscillator. For example, if you want to build a coherent system, it isn't enough just to have a coherent clock in the, for the analog components. You actually need to make sure the numeric oscillators line up. Uh, and, and when you want to start taking data in two systems that actually need to know the phase relative to each other, you have to align all those numeric oscillators and you need to start them at the same moment. Um, it's not always trivial. And you know, then you're going to do some decimation. This is where you're going to frequency select your signals. Uh, this is not the only way to achieve frequency selectivity. There is, of course, multi-rate signal processing where you can do polyphase filter banks, other kinds of filter banks to do this, this, type of, this type of frequency selectivity. But we want to achieve that in order to get the channels of the radio signals out. Uh, to limit the output data rates and the bandwidth that the subsequent signal processing is going to handle. Um, 
sometimes you build systems that handle little bursts of data and you're going to decimate in time. Other times we, we often build systems because it makes synchronization easier that digitize everything continuously. Um, and then you can actually, you can decide not to use complex data if you really don't need it. That saves you, that's, you're, not, you're not having to do that representation. Um, you then usually bring this signal down to what's called baseband. You mix it down to zero frequency, and now you've got a complex signal around zero frequency that we call the baseband IQ output of the software radio. And that's actually where we often do subsequent signal processing for the particular applications that we're interested in. Um, we then, you know, you're, you're going to be digitally mi mixing, decimating, filtering. Um, out of this process, though, you get things that are not just from the analog components or the A to D converter. You get dynamic range issues, spurs. You can clip things. If the numerical values exceed your digital range, your dynamic range of your, your processing words, say you're doing processing in 16 bits of, of signal processing, and all of a sudden your, your signal becomes strong and it clips in the signal processing. Well, you just digitally clipped your signal. And that may not be what you wanted to do. And it, you know, it, it may significantly interfere with the, the application you're trying to do. You can also have numeric artifacts. There's a lot of things that happen, particularly in our processing for radio telescopes, um, array radio telescopes, where the digitization quantization, we actually have to model that and account for it and deconvolve it from the output products of the system in order to get good dynamic <coughs> range. Because uh, it's called Van Vleck correction, and it, 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 it's the <coughs> The numeric artifacts of the quantization in the digital system produce artifacts that actually limit the performance of the instruments. It's absolutely incredible. Um, this is an example of something I did with a student at one point. It was a high dynamic range digital, digital down converter uh, running in an FPGA. And you know, we typical DDCs at the time were getting about 68 dBc of two, with two-tone dynamic range. And we got it up to about 114 by increasing the, the width of the digital path and being careful about the characteristics of the numerical oscillators. Um, you know, a cheap radio may use fewer coefficients, have a less capable FPGA, not be able to do this processing. Very high-end radio may do a better job at this, or at least do a better job of telling you what the problems are and, character and calibrating or characterizing them. Um, on the transmit side, we have waveform generation, which is the dual of this process. You have information, mathematical information, that can be complex. It can be... Uh, Codings that you wish to transmit in a given frequency bandwidth with phase modulation, polarization modulation, amplitude modulation, frequency hopping. Uh, we do a lot of stuff for our geospace radar to study the space environment that uses a wide range of codings for radars, for example. And you know, these are actually some that I've sent uh, the, uh, uh, with our systems that, you know, some of them are traditional. That's a radar Barker code. I'll be talking about radar next week. Uh, but, um, you know, you can actually transmit with these systems and you can look at it here as a function of frequency and time for the millstone UHF radar. And this goes out a D to A, con a converter. All the digital things you did just made the signal have all these artifacts and spurious products, and then you're going to put it on a D to A converter, which these days has gotten really good, but it used to be there were all kinds of artifacts. And then you usually have some analog electronics to move the final signal where you want it, and then a power amplifier and an antenna, and out it goes. And um, you know you should have a frequency license, I'll, I'll say that. Um, now behind all this, um, it depends on how authoritarian you are, okay? <laughs> <laughs> now, um, yeah, there's always been governments. Not right now. Okay. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. Um, all right. Good point. Good point. I, I will not comment on that nor utilize that in my in my presentation. Uh, if you step back from this whole signal processing path, and I've drawn this as reception. Okay, I've, I've drawn this as the A to D, ADC path. It goes the other way. I have viewed this and realized that there was something we call a voltage level data pattern. Okay, And it, it's beyond software radio. It's more general. It has to do with anything we want to process for signal processing. This is biased towards scientific applications where I want traceability. So I build systems where we want to calibrate them, validate that the measurements they make actually are real physical measurements of real physical quantities and attach variances to those physical measurements. And to do that, you need traceability. And I just told you I've been keeping voltages with my, my software radar since 2001. Now, that's getting to be, a, I, I've noticed I'm on my 20th year here at MIT, so it's, it's <laughs> what did I do 20 years ago when I took the voltage? 
how was the software radio hooked up? Did I, you know, what were the filter coefficients? What was the software that was used? Was there a bug? Did I, you know, did I create a problem in my data that later I discovered and want to go back and correct? You need to have metadata, data that describes data. So you have a sensor element. There's some analog system that conditions and transfers the data. There's an A to D converter. There is co conversion coherence. That's the clock. But it's the clock in the more general sense of its alignment to glo a global time standard. You then have digital transfer functions that you can apply more than one. You don't have to take this digital stream and just process it once. You can utilize computing to process it as many times as you really want to. If you keep it around, you can do it again. Um, voltage data sequences come out of this. These data sequences can actually be used to generate conversion coherence sometimes. You can measure the system you're trying to use, determine what the clocks are, synchronize the systems in software, and then use it for an application that requires coherence. So the clock doesn't necessarily always have to be an atomic clock. It can use a physical property of a system that you know is invariant uh, as a function of clock drift, for example. Um, then you've got a voltage level representation. You need to put this voltage nut representation into a namespace. That's how I describe the data. Where does it go? Is there, what channels are there? What does the channel mean? Am I hooked to an antenna? Am I not hooked to an antenna? I can't tell you how often I work with software radios and go, is the damn thing really hooked to the right channel? I mean, I built a, I built a system at one point that had, you know, a lot of these newer radios, the, multi, the expensive ones have multiple inputs. I can't tell you what a pain in the ass multiple inputs are from the point of view of knowing, did I connect the right one? <laughs> Edis is at least nice. They put a nice LED on it, and you can tell which one's on if you're there. If my radio is thousands of miles away and I'm communicating it to it via SATCOM, that's a little harder, okay? Um, so I like, I like per element digitizers myself, but there's often cost, you know, sometimes you want to look at a lot of antennas and you want one data system and you don't want to pay to have 16 channels or 32 channels. Uh, we're then taking all this metadata and combining it into a representation of the voltage. We then want to do things with that. We may want to do signal processing. That gets fork in, that goes into a transport. You're going to move the data to a signal processing element, or you want to keep it. That's persistence. We want to store it in a layout or a form, a data format. So you have data formats that are transport formats, and you have persistence formats. This is moving the data for signal processing. This is keeping it. All right, streaming formats. One of the ways a lot of the radios that are software radios today work is they stream data out to a computer to do something with it. And they often do this at different layers of Processing. It could be at PCI Express. Often it's at Ethernet. So often there's UDP packets streaming out of these radios if they're Ethernet connected. Uh, could be USB is in here, and you've got USB packets streaming to the host. Um, and this data, you know, there's data, data. There's sometimes met metadata. Sometimes it's interleaved. Sometimes there's multiple channels. Uh, it's kind of a choice how you do that. Then the other way to do this are block formats. They look like arrays. This is actually really convenient for signal processing often, is you want to do signal processing. I want to load a chunk of data. I want it to start at time A, go to time B. I want to FFT it. OK, I, I want to pull in those samples and process them. And then I want to know the metadata for that particular time interval. So streaming formats are packet oriented. Block formats are array oriented. Midas CW was the format we developed for its software radar at Millstone Hill, and this was a streaming format. It's circa 2000. Uh, we started with 100 megabit Ethernet, I'll come back to that later, and gigaflop computers. You could, you could just about get a, a nice gigaflop computer at the time um, for not too much money. And you know, we were able to do nice digitization. This is radar pulse going out, this is the ground clutter response, this is the noise floor uh, where the ionospheric return is actually down in the noise, you can kind of see it there. And this is a noise diode we eject for calibration. And it supported real-time processing, and it actually looks a lot like what GNU Radio and others have gone to with stream formats uh, using UDP. Uh, it was a little earlier in some ways. Uh, there's a lot of problems with this actually. Metadata is often incomplete with these systems. You're streaming. You have limited amount of information available to send stuff describing your, your voltages that you're going to process. Uh, the data format and transport are very tight, tightly coupled. They're often brittle and inflexible. Um, on the other hand, you can do a marvelous thing, which is you can fan the data out to a whole host of computers and do parallel processing. So you can increase your computing at the expense of your metadata information. Uh, the data format does not 
scale easily with bandwidth also, unless you're always unless you're careful with these. Uh, an example of a more modern version of this is the Vita radio, radio transport format or digital IF. This came about and became an ANSI standard out of the DOD and, and um, the, you know, the, the radio community, the uh, government funded software radio community in about 2009. The idea was to create a standard signal and metadata transport that let you do FPGA to FPGA processing or FPGA to network processing. It has coherency and timestamps. It lets you build phased arrays and nobody implemented the same standard anywhere. Edis radios, for example, adhere to a subset of the standard, and so they really are Vita you know, underneath. You never kind of see it because they hide it with nice software wrappers that don't make you deal with this. And if you tried to plug it into a system from, say, Mercury Systems, you're going to have a lot of work to do. <laughs> Not impossible, maybe, but you'll have a lot of work to do. Um, Digital RF is a block-oriented format we've developed for scientific applications and is open source. You can go here if you would like it. Uh, it works very well with GNU Radio and Edis Radios, and um, it is designed around block-level persistence of radio data for scientific applications. We have a corresponding metadata format. And I, I had, I, I worked with a colleague of mine who's now in Norway, but he was at Haystack at the time. And he wanted things as simple as possible. And I wanted really good metadata. And we fought it out for two years with uh, our software engineer in the middle, implementing what we came up with and we tested and tried. And it's turned into something really wonderful for us. Um, we have lots of utilities like ring buffers and snapshots. I'll talk about that. It's order one to look up data. It's very fast to record and to get the data you want. And the brilliant thing that we that Yuha did, who is my colleague in this, is we organized things in terms of absolute time steps relative to the epoch 1970. So January 1st, 1970 is sample zero. All right? And I think there's I I want to say it's 128 bit, but it might be only it might be I don't think it's 64 bit, but we've got a really large timestamp <laughs> in the data. Uh, what this lets us do is when I take data with a system, I trigger my software radios for scientific purposes using, say, GPS stabilized oscillators and a pulse per second from the constellation. That lets me time align the data to a very specific UTC epoch. Whether I have a software radio here at MIT campus or out at MIT Haystack, they'll both start within some error bound of each other. I then ask for the sample I want in absolute samples at the sample rate. And I can ask for a thousand samples, and I get asked for them from the two systems, and now I can do joint signal processing. And there can be fine levels of alignment that are needed, but it's a whole lot easier to align it when you're starting within 20, 20 nanoseconds than it is when you're starting within minutes, for example. <clears throat> I, I welcome you to try this if you'd like to, uh, and you have an application. And we, we don't provide a lot of support for it, but we are actively developing, developing it and do fix issues. So I, I mentioned multicast transports. So <clears throat> the transports of data, well, you can have your software radio transmit, and then you can take data, and there's a pattern we call a distributor that puts data on networks, and then you can do parallel signal processing. You can have real-time recording. You can have real-time visualization. This is how our Midas W system actually worked. Um, when doing multicasting, you can have different types of transport. You can say, I don't care if I drop packets. I care if I drop packets a little bit. I really don't want to drop packets, or I'm going to make it, try to make it fully deterministic. So I really don't drop packets. Um, there's also latencies involved with various architectures and, and transports that you use. But the idea is, is you, know, you can actually do parallel processing of input streams very efficiently with this type of architecture. Uh, ring buffers are another thing we use extensively in our systems. This is the idea that data comes in, you've got a certain amount of some sort of digital storage to represent the data, and then consumers use it, and eventually you expire it and you reuse that digital storage. Uh, we use this for rate management in software radio systems. It allows us, with a RAM buffer on a computer, to sustain much higher gap-free data rates. Um, we can layer it, we can run a ring buffer in RAM, followed by a ring buffer in solid state disk, followed by a ring buffer in our cloud file system. And depending on what, what you want to do, uh, you can put signal processing in between, so you can have ring buffer to signal processing. And you can manage processing latency with this also, as you can, you know, if this ring buffer is big, the latency can be years. I mean, we've had systems we've built where the bandwidths are 50 or 100 hertz, and we can keep data for 30 years in a typical instrument. 
And it's the same format, the same representation. You could ring buffer it if you really wanted to. Um, bandwidths that we can do with that with as memory density increases are going to become uh, much, much higher. You know, if we really get mem resistor memory and everything transforms from our current SSDs, which are marvelous, to something even more marvelous in terms of data storage, and, and we can keep gigahertz of bandwidth, well, we can take almost any antenna we want, except some really wide band ones, and we could just keep all the data forever, okay? Everything. You have a network of it. You could capture the RF for the whole planet, maybe, all right? Um, you can prevent data loss. By using ring buffers, you can snapshot. You can say, I want to keep this interval, but not another interval based on another trigger. Say you have a radio astronomy application like fast radio bursts, and a system is built that detects it in real time, and you have another sensor system that maybe can't process the data in real time but could keep the voltages. Well, if you have a trigger, you can say keep time A to time B. Boom, snapshot it to the memory. The average data rate through the system goes down, and you've kept, kept just the events that are of interest to you scientifically. So, uh, you know, it can occur at the radio or at the network transport or combination. Uh, we've been developing cloud scale software radio at MIT Haystack. Um, this has been tougher, I'd say, mostly because these, these cloud systems are <coughs> tough to set up and maintain, but we've had some success at being able to parallelize uh, processing across systems. And uh, you know, we're, we've got visions of, of really scaling to large, you know, large amounts of computing. Uh, my typical computing loads uh, have gone from you know, tens to hundreds of giga ops per second of data from a single radio channel we're processing. Our channel counts have gone from a few channels up towards hundreds of channels. Uh, my typical experiment for one of my systems that we've been developing is about a petabyte of data for the experiment. So you, you, you scale this up and you need parallel computing to deal with it. Um, Real-time processing, well, there's a lot of latency involved in this too. It's not necessarily applicable. You know, you, very often a real-time system would implement a lot of this processing in FPGAs, for example, that are linked to each other. Now the astronomy community has been developing advanced radio apertures that have grown out of this era of software radio. And uh, these are just examples of some of them. <clears throat> I've been involved with these at both a kibitzing level and more recently at a development level with things like the square kilometer array that's being developed. Um, this is a long wavelength array in New Mexico. This is uh, between 10 and 70 megahertz. Every one of those is a little bent dipole, bat wing dipole type antenna uh, with LNAs and every one of them is backed with a software radio um, system with some bandwidth. This is a system MIT Haystack developed with a whole team of people, including MIT Kavli and uh, people in Western Australia and India that is in Western Australia. There's a thousand uh, antennas like this. This is a tile. These are little bat wing dipoles with LNAs. Every one of these systems is combined using analog electronics that allow phasing. And then we've got a whole series of these spread around the Australian desert. Now, why is it in Australia? Well, there's 10 to the minus 3 humans per square kilometer. Okay? So, haystacks, noisy, and we, we're our own worst enemies because we have megawatt radars. Out here at campus, well, there's a city full of people with radios and other things that make radio energy, even though they're not radios. Um, if you want to do astronomy, you have got to go get out of here. You know, you got to go get away from, from, from MIT and from, from New England and most of continental North America often. And, you know, any place there's a lot of, a lot of people. Uh, although one of my colleagues, Alan Rogers, who you'll hear from, he's found a place in eastern Oregon that we're going to check out because it may be the quietest place in the country. Uh, and there's a friendly rancher who owns the land who'll let us put some radio equipment there. But uh, Europeans have developed a system called LOFAR that operates um, over two bands. There's a high band system over here that's about about, I want to say 110 megahertz to 300 megahertz and then there's low band system that operates from about 15 to uh, 90 megahertz. Um, this is a version of the LOFAR system used to do radar. This is a kind of ionospheric radar <coughs> I do that I'm not going to talk about today. But these systems take the data from every one of these elements digitally as software and then they correlate it. They cross compare every pair of antennas. All right. And that gives you phase information about the spatial distribution of the energy that is impinging on the array. It's the Fresnel pattern you're measuring, you're oversampling it, and it allows you to back out the image of the sky. 
And these systems are applicable to radar. You can use them for all kinds of things and are a very exciting development. Uh, Square Kilometer Array's prototype, they're doing a lot of bureaucracy right now. They have a government that functions. It makes them do bureaucracy. But um, the, they're trying to put out a prototype for the low frequency aperture that we helped the, with the, on the antennas of 100,000 antennas uh, that will each be digitized at giga samples and cross-correlated, all right? It's an incredible effort to open up the radio universe. Now you can use that for radar if you want to. I can use it for studying geospace. Um, when you build out software radios to do these things, there's physical stuff that has to go with those antennas and make the software radios do the useful applications. I put a lot of software radios in transport racks. These are these Pelican racks. They're beautiful. They're rugged. They're not too expensive. You pack your software radios into them and you send them places and hook them to antennas and do your application, try to do some science. I like to use these to look at satellite beacons and their, the ionospheric effects on them. Uh, this One of these is, that is UHF, that's VHF. This is a satellite coming towards you in frequency and then it's Doppler shifted away from you. As it goes away. I also like to do a thing called passive radar, which I won't talk about today, but I like to look at plasma turbulence in the space environment using FM radio signals. Um, I had a really funny experience where I showed up at a meeting for some DOD types and they got up and gave their presentation and showed their rack of electronics and I got up and showed my rack of electronics and they were almost identical. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was hilarious because, you know, the same problem led to the same solutions. All right. Uh, box level system. So everything about five years ago got smaller. Okay, it got it got to be about this big. So these racks you saw, they're they're fairly fairly sizable. Now it became boxes. Okay, so these are this is a giga sample prototype for a project we have called Rapid. This is uh, the the Edis version of this using B210 radio. Actually, it says N300s. There's N300 N200s and B210s we use in these boxes. These are EMI tight boxes with a computer and there's a G, there's a low noise power supply we built and a G, relays and a GPS is hiding in there. Uh, we've done this with GPS systems for fieldable instruments. This was a three watt data collection envelope. Uh, for fielding in Alaska that we had intended to put it out in like August to take data in, in the near, you know in Alaska of the aurora, of uh, radio effects on GPS from the Aurora and it ended up going out in November and December with solar battery power but it actually worked because I had over specified the power quite a bit uh, but you know these are 10 to 100 watt class things and the, if you build in boxes it's useful for like 20 of you can make like 20 of them and then they, they stop unless it's like an industrial partner and they're really careful in quality control you never keep them consistent or configured the same that's actually a big configuration control is the big challenge in software radio that we've only kind of recently learned how to deal with properly I'd say um, these are going to get smaller everything is going to disappear into the antenna eventually okay so this is Rapid, I want this is a whole nother talk, but Rapid is our effort with Cambridge University and the square kilometer array low frequency aperture to take square, you know, radio astronomy antennas. This is square kilometer array uh, low, low frequency aperture antenna. This is the long wavelength array antenna, which covers HF. And we're working to put software radios in platforms that we can solar and battery power that are low enough EMI they don't interfere with each uh, themselves and that we can physically deploy on short notice where we want to build radio interferometers. So we can go out and reconfigure the interferometer, we can deploy sparse apertures, we can operate with high power transmitters, uh, there's all kinds of stuff, and then it's got the cloud scale signal processing behind it. That was the motivation for the cloud scale signal processing. And there's a lot of science applications I'll highlight after, after a short demo. Uh, eventually, all that electronics is gonna live you know, in here. We're putting it in the base and we have a lot of area to put it in boxes, but you know, we can get a lot, we can get rid of a lot of it. Uh, and then you can make this stuff network wirelessly and, and then you have solar battery power antenna with wireless software radio that's mesh networking. And lo and behold, you've built a ad hoc disconnected radio interferometer and then you self-synchronize against the environment for the clock. I was going to say on the clock, is GPS good enough for your interferometers? Some. We've worked very hard on stable clocks. We're ending up in our current series, we are on GPS stabilized clocks. That They're good enough depending on how many antennas you have and how long you have to integrate. We actually go through a, you know, the idea here is actually to bring all the data from Rapid Home on SSD to the cloud computer. At which point we can do a process of attempting to solve for the clock 
for various applications. And sometimes you have to broadcast a beacon to allow you to synchronize systems if you're somewhere that you can't see the radio sky very effectively, for example. Other times you can watch known radio stars that you know where they are and you can bootstrap and phase up. And we can do it iteratively and try to get convergence of a clock model. And then we apply the clock model in the cloud computer to the software radio voltages and correct them out and create a virtually aligned system uh, in the signal processor. That's a longer question. The, the depends on you know the frequency you're at, of course. Um, the typical drifts are degree a second, a few degrees a second drifts in the radios. And in fact, the architectures of the current software radios make it worse than the direct digitizers uh, because they often upconvert. So it, it makes the oscillators become important. Um, so software radio demo. I am going to attempt a demo. Um, I, I always swear I'm never going to do this because it has trouble, but we're going we're gonna to give it a shot here. I think what we're going to do first is we're going to do a tool called GQRX. You can go download this. It's open source. We love open source in general. We can't open source everything we do, uh, but um, you know, very often we're, we're heavy users of it and we contribute back where we can. So this, this is GQRX. You can go get this. This talks to a radio. This is the analog device is Pluto radio. It's a few hundred dollars. You can go buy one. It covers 300 megahertz up to 325 megahertz to 3.5 gigahertz. It's a beautiful little software radio module that analog devices has made speak USB. And underneath this, um, you know, there's, you know, this, this then has, there's a library that interfaces to the radio. And if I press this button, we'll hope, hopefully get things and turn the audio up. Uh, maybe we'll get to hear something if it's still working. All right, so the Millstone radar is in theory transmitting at about 440.2 megahertz today. And if everything is going well and they are still on, we will be able to hear them. And so far, I don't see them. So perhaps everything is not going well. Um, let's see here. Gains high. All right, I was seeing them early. So, oh. Hey, hey, there we go. That's a lot better. Now, if, if they're really there, we'll help hear popping. We cannot hear you when that's buzzing. You can't hear me when that's buzzing. Okay. This is not the, the radar. Okay, we're going to give up on the radar for the moment. Um, actually, there's another program I can load. Let's see here. Are you sure you don't want you to try to line 12? Let's see here. Let's open. Yeah, that's what we should 12 by 5 is the one we usually do. Oh, 12 by 9. That's the all-band radar. Oh, we, yeah. could, we could try the all-band radar. They operate a little more than us. They, Let's. Blind, they blind the green building fish. Oh, do they? Yeah. yeah your radio is right here, right? Yeah, my radio is right here. So, uh, and it's actually, you know, it's a little, a little monopole antenna. Let's see here. Can I get that? Let's see here. Okay. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to switch to the next one. So I, I, of course, have more than one demo because I don't like only one demo. Okay. This is GNU Radio Companion. So this is the GNU Radio thing that you'll interact with. It's graphical. And, all right. So this is a narrow band waterfall plot, and we're going to bring the make it auto scale so you can see it a little better. And this, that's the beaconing signal for uh, an emergency vehicle. You know, it's the the um, first aid car um, radio that they've got, and maybe they'll say something. The the radio sitting there beaconing. Uh, we're listening to it with, uh, I believe, FM demodulation narrow band right now. And if they're really nice to us, they'll say something. Uh, they were talking up a storm earlier, but I think they probably all went to dinner. Um, so, but you can actually see there's several channels there. You can see multiple radios beaconing. You can see other signals going on. Maybe we'll tune up to one of those and, uh, and take a listen on it. Let's see here. And the moment I go away from this channel, you know what's going to happen, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. All right. Okay, I got to get up a little higher, about 25 kilo. Put your arm up. That's nice. Turn up the switch. Yeah. So you can see, software is the limitation, or the human user interface is, is a limitation. So this is probably some sort of data signal. 
you can of course do this yourself with a nice little software radio and go try to find all the people who are who are talking about various things. Um, pop up a level and explain what you're trying to do. Okay, so, so at a high level, what I'm trying to do is just show you information and audio from the software radio. Oh, okay. <laughs> there you go. What I'm trying to do is simply show you operation of the software radios with some tools that you could go get yourself. Um, so GNU Radio, for example, is a tool that you can get that allows you to create signal processing with flow graphs. Okay, so it's a data, it's a data streaming language. You can take an input and you can take that input and actually um, apply signal processing to it and then utilize output to make visualization. So for example, here is this Pluto software radio source. There's a lot of settings that go with it to configure the radio. Data is then connected by the flow graph to stream into the waterfall plot, for example, that you were seeing that then is doing an FFT and, and visualizing the signal for you. Uh, similarly, the GQRX program does software radio. Uh, it's actually written in a different manner that's maybe a little more efficient in its performance and it's more oriented on communications type applications. Um, so, you know, I can look at different signals. If we were lucky, they would be saying something and we would hear them, hear them speaking with software radio where we've demodulated it. And of course, you know, if you took this data and applied multiple signal processing and channelized a lot of channels, you could pick out different signals uh, with different information and even determine what the modulations are to potentially and then demodulate them. So um, let's see here. Why don't we stop that one? And uh, I'll show you, for example, what Wi-Fi looks like. This one doesn't take any audio. Um, so right now we're looking at noise, okay? So this is not the Wi-Fi frequency band. I tuned down to 1.6 gigahertz. And I'm just gonna average the signal here and I'm, I'm, gonna, I, I'm gonna turn the averaging the other way. I wanna average the signal a little more. And um, the, uh, let's see, that's actually averaging down. So we're, we're averaging down there. There's not you know, much there. That spur, that spur in the center is actually a spur. That's leakage of the local oscillator used in the analog tuner and the radio into the receiver and into the data. So I'm looking at you know, power versus frequency there and right in the center, where I really want to look for my signal often, <laughs> there is the, you know, an artifact of the software radio and the, the particular in implementation. A lot of software radios use this type of tuner architecture because it gets them wa very wide frequency coverage. All right, you don't actually have to build software radios to do that, it's a choice. Um, very often what we do is we offset in frequency slightly and then we'll process data by digitally converting it and we use a cleaner digital oscillator than the analog oscillator and we get the signal back that we want without the artifact. Now, if I go down here and I switch up to a Wi-Fi channel and I turn the averaging and put peak hold on, that's actually Wi-Fi energy rattling around the room on channel four. And uh, we can look at a waterfall plot of that. And what you see is the Wi-Fi is, is going out here in little bursts of energy that are very short in time. And you know, there's, you're actually seeing a couple channels there because the channels are separated by five megahertz. And uh, you know, you've, you can you can select a different channel. We could go down a channel. Looks like there's more activity on the two adjacent. Channels. Yeah, I think you're right. It's actually probably centered on two. So there you go. That's that's centered on two. And um, you know, the the our radios and our computers, all the Wi-Fi we're using, there's a protocol, there's a set of channels. They're often spreading the energy across multiple channels in order to get wide data bandwidths to the routers that are involved. But you can sit here and you can watch this, and this, this is the same little box. You know, so I can do UHF, I can do Wi-Fi with it, there's wider tuner ones. Um, this is an RTL SDR, I'm not gonna demo with that, but it's, it's you know, this little, little wonderful device that you can make marvelous things happen with. So you too can go experience software radar and play and radio and play with it. I'm going to go back, I think, to the slides now and, uh, and finish up. So let's see here. All right. Um, so I'm motivated to use software radio to explore the space environment and, and kind of learn scientifically about our universe. And there's lots of things that produce radio waves for, through natural processes. 
Uh, there's, of course, things that produce radio waves through artificial processes. Um, and so, you know, this is, for example, the Milky Way galaxy in visible light. You've got, um, there's a black hole right in the center of our galaxy that's very interesting uh, called Sagittarius A. You can actually see it down here much better than here. And radio, of course, provides us a window of looking at the universe, you know, and different physical processes. And some things propagate better. Some things are absorbed by things in between us and the emitting source. Um, and so this is actually something called galactic synchrotron emission. This is a, a map made of the galaxy at 408 megahertz. And you can pick out these bright sources that that's a black hole, that's a black hole. Um, you know, you have lots of, lots of strong emitters, but there's also this diffuse emission that's tracing out the magnetic field, the galaxy. And it's, it's electrons bending and emitting radio waves at specific frequencies. And you can do this at a, at a wide range of frequencies. We're also very interested in doing a lot of work on solar radio emissions. The sun is a very active star. It emits radio emissions in bursts often. Uh, and we can actually go in with these interferometric systems and point locate very precisely in frequency and time where the radio emissions are coming from and relate it to the acceleration structures that are moving the plasma in the space environment and allowing and, and making those radio waves be generated. And that's telling you about the solar physics that's going on at, in the energetic outburst that the sun creates. Um, similar processes occur at the planets. Uh, they occur, for example, at Jupiter. Uh, this is frequency versus time with the, that radio telescope I showed you in New Mexico. And this is actually radio emission from Jupiter from particles bouncing back in the magnetosphere of Jupiter in the magnetic field, but modulated by the existence of the moons of Jupiter. And so you can actually tell things about the moons. You can see the, the phase when this occurs and is visible on Earth is very dependent on the cone angle that the radio signals are emitted through. If you go up to higher frequencies and you have a high resolution radio telescope, you can make an image of Jupiter, uh, of the radio emission. And this is the planet in there. And this is that magnetosphere of Jupiter. Um, processes like this, you can look for molecular radio lines. Haystack's done a lot of work along those, those lines. Um, once that material that comes off the sun and these energetic events goes into the solar system, it actually produces conditions often that create the planetary radio emissions. It also comes and encounters the near space environment of the Earth, at which point we can use active remote sensing techniques and passive techniques to measure what's happening in the near space environment of the Earth or in geospace. Uh, so I've done a lot of geospace science over the years using radar. Uh, we typically, are, our flagship instruments are incoherent scatter radars, which are megawatt class systems, usually in UHF to L band or VHF to L band that are uh, used with antennas that are about a hectare. So you need a megawatt hectare. And we put out uh, you know, megawatts and we get tens of femtowatts back. And it looks like noise, okay? But the noise has a spectral signature of the near space environment as a function of range and angle and time imprinted on it. And we can back the physics out because this is an extremely good forward theory that lets us predict what the spectral response should be. And the space environment of the Earth is very complex. There's all kinds of beautiful phenomena like the Earth's aurora. There's lots of physical processes. This is a, a NASA drawing that was done of, of trying to summarize all the things that were going on. And then to make it even more complicated, we're discovering that there's a tremendous number of effects coming from the neutral atmosphere below that never, even though the atmosphere falls off in density as you go up, um, it impacts the upper atmosphere. And all of this impacts radio propagation and the, the, it affects the ionosphere. It impacts, we can measure the processes with radio and with radar. Um, I'm interested in next generation radar concepts for scientific discovery where we unify radio telescopes and radars. One of the things software radars, radios are letting us do is to begin to create systems where we use digital signal processing to create dynamic range. Uh, this is often called simultaneous transmit and receive, and it allows us to build systems that both transmit and receive on the same channel simultaneously. We're often using spatial diversity to do this. We're using beamforming techniques and a lot and a lot of computation. This is work done by MIT Lincoln Laboratory on this that produced 140.5 dB of effective dynamic range. It's not quite the dynamic range of the whole universe, but it's starting to get close. And uh, you know, this can be in the future produce instrumentation that combines radar, radio astronomy, space surveillance, communications, all in a single large aperture if it needs to be a large aperture, or in a smaller aperture if the application demands it. Uh, we're looking at next generation radio astronomy. 
This is a diagram of the same architecture we came up with in 2000, 2001. We did it at 100 megabits per second then. We're up to 10 gigabits per second now. We're looking at 100 gigabits to terabit per second per port for wide bandwidth radio astronomy applications. Solid state data recording, of course, and RAM data recording. Um, there's a lot of stuff that goes in here, high stability clocks, but this is architecturally a software radio network. Okay, you can have multiple backends plugged into it simultaneously. You can share computation and you can actually have multiple application stacks running in real time doing say a, pr a primary application scientifically or doing commensurate a, a, a commensal analysis for a different application. And people are realizing architectures like this, not just in MIT Haystack, but places like NRAO and, and the VLA and so forth. Uh, we also at MIT Haystack have a very exciting project, which is software radios go to space. Okay, this is a pair of satellites we've been funded to create by NASA called Aero and Vista. And the goal here is to put two satellites in polar orbit around the Earth at about four or 500 kilometers and to look at radio emissions from the Earth's aurora from space using a very advanced soft, uh, antenna called an electromagnetic ve vector sensor that allows us to get spatial selectivity and directivity from an antenna with a common phase center. It's basically three cross dipoles measuring orthogonal components and three cross loops measuring or orthogonal components in one antenna. And that it measures the entire information content of the electromagnetic wave that's impinging on that antenna. And you can use that information to solve for, say, the direction of arrival of that. And in the Earth's aurora, amazingly enough, there's a lot of questions at very low frequencies. Now, this is going to be done down below about 15 megahertz. And most of the emissions are down at a couple megahertz. And they shouldn't get to the ground ever from the space environment. And yet we know from ground-based observations we see them. And there's propagation mode changes and ducting. And we don't really know where the emissions are actually coming from. And so this mission will allow us to do that. Arrow was going to do that and just measure it. Vista is going to fly along with Arrow and let us do interferometry and demonstrate vector sensor interferometry in space in order to measure these, this environment. Uh, it's a very exciting project. We're just starting these uh, satellites. And so in three years, uh, hopefully we'll be able to, or four years, we'll be able to report success, I hope. Um, you know, it's, uh, these things are you know, software radios that are this big that pop out a four meter antenna. It's very cool. Um, one U satellite? Oh, I'm sorry? One U satellite? Three U. Three U. Maybe six U, we'll see. We're, we, we're trying to cram it in three U. Uh, and it, it, it has about 15 to 20 watts of average power, so it's, it's got to be power f efficient. So my conclusion about software radio is, you know, there's no better time to be interested in software radio. There's no greater availab availability so far. There is a huge future of doing new ideas, new radios, invention and discovery, what you want to do with these radios. Um, you know, I've talked about some of the things I'm interested in doing, and that's the future I'm going out to create with these. But, you know, I certainly hope that you will all be inspired to go invent your own future and to uh, encourage others to do so also. So thank you very much. And I'll put up the overview of the talks. This is how it all fits together. I was told to do this. <laughs> if there are questions, I'll, I'll be happy to. Your all access array antenna loops and dipoles gets an answer from all of them at once, or it's time switched? No, they are digitized simultaneously. There's something called a mode former, actually, that takes the antenna is treated differentially, and it is creating the dipole-like modes and the loop-like modes simultaneously. So there's six channels per antenna to be digitized. So although you have it one antenna, it's got six software radio channels behind it. And then you're doing covariance processing behind it in order to pull out the, the full information content. You really have six antennas. Uh, I'm sorry? You really have six antennas. There's six antennas with one phase center. Uh, there, it's, a, it's an interesting question. You know, is a phased array antenna that's made of multiple sensors and antenna or an ensemble of antennas? Um, you know, at some level, from the analog point of view, it's an ensemble of antennas. Uh, from the point of view of the output product, it's a single antenna if you calibrate it properly. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.